Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Adventures of a Real Estate Investor. I'm Susie. And I'm Michael. We're excited you joined us for this adventure. So today's very special guest is Michael Album. Thank you so much for joining us today. My, my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on, you two. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, and we're super excited because it's really wonderful to meet people who are in real estate and also like pursuing the whole lifestyle design thing, you know? And so I can't wait until you could share a little bit about that and more about you with our listeners. So thank you, thank you, thank you again for being here with us. Absolutely. I thought well, you were going to say you're excited to meet another Michael. And I was going to say, yeah, me too. <laughs> That's a great <laughs> name. <laughs> one, one of the best, if, if, as far as I'm concerned. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And Michael usually has a mustache, so he's missing out on know. today. We yeah. could have been the mustache Michaels. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, mustache, yeah. All right. Sure. Next time. Next time. <laughs> but just cancel this recording. We'll be back in, in like a month. Yeah. We're, <laughs> yeah. A cu couple weeks. couple weeks. And what's really cool is Michael's coming from us. The first time we'd, we've done an interview with somebody who's in a camper van, which is really cool. Like a travel van. Michael is on the road in Southern Oregon, which is cool. Yeah. But Michael, we want to learn more about you and our listeners want to learn more about you. Would you mind sharing with our adventurous family a little bit more about your background and like why you started investing in real estate? Yeah, absolutely. So I did the very traditional thing. I think like so many of your listeners and probably so many of your guests have done, go to school, go to college, get good grades and go get a good job. And so I did the thing. And by the time I got my great job, I said, this is awesome. I've arrived. I've done it. I <laughs> I'm, I've been to the mountaintops. Right. Cheers. Just, yeah. yeah. Like mission accomplished next. And by a few weeks in, I got my first paycheck and I saw how much in taxes were coming out because I'm a California native, California resident. And I was like, this just is not going to get me going where I want to go fast enough. And so then I started reading a book, which I'm sure you two have read and a lot of your listeners have read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And it kind of slapped me upside the head and it, it frustrated me because it totally changed the way that I thought about money and the way that money was earned. And so I started getting self-educated in real estate along with the help of my dad at the time. And so we just started going through this journey together and he knew a little bit about it from, from growing up and from his family background, but it was totally brand new for me. Self-educated for about two years and then said, I'm going to go buy a rental property. People are doing this. It's possible. At the time, bigger pockets really wasn't around, roof stock wasn't around. So I was just piecing it together for myself. And so I went and bought a property and I was scared like to bits. I could not believe how much debt I was signing, <laughs> like signing my name to. And so I got a tenant in place and the first rent check came in and I was like, I'm a genius. I'm a freaking, I figured, I figured out the keys to the castle. I figured it out. <laughs> so I said, if I could do this once a year for 10 years, in 10 years, I'll have 10 properties and that'll be good because that just sounded like a good round number. Mm -hmm. And I was making a couple hundred bucks a month. And I said, great, I'll have a couple thousand bucks a month and, and then I'll be right on my way. And so I did that for a couple of years and I kind of had an unfair advantage for a couple of reasons. So the job that I was working, I was working as a professional fire protection engineer and nobody knows what that is, myself included at the time until I got the job. <laughs> we, tr we try to prevent buildings from burning down. That's what we do. And I was working for an insurance company and I was traveling all over the country for work. And so I would go to these places and I would have someone else pay for all of my expenses. I would schedule my own schedule. And so I had a ton of free time. And so I was looking at the real estate markets wherever I was. And I found that in a lot of these places I was ending up for work, there were these amazing real estate markets and I was kind of green. So amazing from my perspective of the, just that the rent to price ratios made a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. And that's all I knew to look at at the time. And I was like, great, this is awesome. So I was buying up places wherever I was going for work. And I felt kind of like a slug leaving this trail of purchased properties. <laughs> and I'm like, I, after a couple of years, I'm like, I, like, again, I'm a genius. I figured it out. I'm so well diversified. If anything happens in market A, I'm in B through E and vice versa. But it just got to a point where it was mentally it just exhausting. Because mm -hmm. I was using professional property management in every market I was in. And so managing the manager, as I'm sure you well know, and your listeners know, can be a full-time job into and of itself. Mm -hmm. So I got some advice from a friend of mine who was a bit further along in his career than mine. He says, Michael, go focus on one or two markets hammer them hard and watch what happens. It'll blow your mind. And I was like, okay, I'll give that a go. So I've been laser focused on two markets in the Midwest for the last five or six years now. And that's been amazing. And it, just from a consolidation standpoint, it's so much easier to make one phone call and get mm -hmm. updates about five properties as opposed to 
five calls for five properties. Yeah. So now 2018, yeah, about 2018, my father actually passed away and Amazing. I was still working as an engineer. Yeah, thanks. Um, I was still working as an engineer. I told the company, hey, I need some time to kind of go do a hard reset. Just I'll come back and work for you in six months, but I just, I need to go and be and do. And they said, I'm sorry, we can't hold your job for that long. And I said, well, oh. I'm sorry, I can't work here anymore. I'm out. So I was engaged at the time, about to be married. So my wife and I then went and started traveling the world for about a year or so. And then COVID hit, pandemic struck. We got a calls that said, Michael, Claire, you got to come home. The borders are closing. So we jammed home and moved into a place. And then uh, we decided we didn't quite, uh, we weren't quite done finished with our wiggle. So we converted a van, had a van converted converted like we did the work yeah right we had a van <laughs> like so many others during the pandemic and then went and did van life for about seven eight months during the pandemic and then recently moved up to northern california where we're house hacking a duplex and now here we are today so i know that was long-winded hopefully most of your listeners stuck with us but here we are of course they did what do you mean your story is phenomenal <laughs> <laughs> so I, I have so much I have a question. Where were some of the sporadic markets that weren't the ones that you are now honing in on? Yeah. So I started in Southern California, a couple hours south of where I grew up. So it was a market that I knew I grew growing up. Like my grandfather had a mobile home down there that we used to go vacation at. And so it was this little town where we knew a property manager, we knew an agent. And so we just started there because it was familiar. And then so I did a couple of deals there. And then I was up in Ketchikan, Alaska, which mm. anyone who's been on Alaskan cruise has probably stopped at. It's kind of a port city, a cruise line city. And then St. Robert, Missouri and Waterford, Michigan. So kind of all over the yeah. place. And I was of the mindset of, I let the market, I let the deal dictate the market. Yeah. Wherever the numbers made sense, that's where I would go. I didn't care where it was, you know, what the deal, what the deal was, as long as it made sense financially. Yeah. And because I'm an engineer, reformed engineer, rather, I like to say, a recovering engineer. Yeah. I, uh, I speak in, in math and equations. So if the numbers make sense, it was a go for me. Yeah. And then where are your two main markets now? Now is Cincinnati, Ohio and Covington, Kentucky, which okay. I had never heard of. I mean, I've heard, yeah. of, I've heard of Cincinnati, but I hadn't heard of Covington. And it's got a very, like these two markets, they're technically two separate markets and they're in two different states, but they're separated by a bridge and a river. Oh, okay. So if anyone's familiar with like the Bay Area, it's like Oakland and San Francisco. Yeah. People will live in Covington because it's cheaper, but work in Cincinnati. So it's got this kind of duality effect that's really unique that I think you'll find in a couple other markets throughout the country. And so it gives you kind of, I think, the best of both worlds. Nice. Is that where the airport, Cincinnati airport's like? In yes. Kentucky, right. Yeah. It's in Covington. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Which no one knows because it's called Cincinnati airport. Yeah. Cincinnati <laughs> airport in Kentucky. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. It. Makes total sense. <laughs> and I have another, sorry, I have another question. Why are you in a van right now? Okay. So it's a great question. <laughs> so my wife and I, we bought a house hack in the Bay area and that was, I, it was something that I really had wanted to do for a long time. I had heard tons of people do it. I've talked to people that do it because now I actually work at a company called RoofSock and work as their uh, head coach and program manager. So I do, I teach real estate investing for a living now. Oh, and cool. so I had talked to a lot of people that had done it and I had, I, I had, and I said, I don't like to talk or teach about things that I haven't done yet. And so this will be some great experience for us. So we bought a duplex and we rented out the upstairs unit. We're living in the downstairs unit. We had our upstairs tenant decide that they would like to stay longer than their, than their original lease term. But we already had their unit leased starting that same day that they were supposed to leave. And so my wife goes, well, what if we just rent out our unit to the people that are coming? And I said, okay, let's, let's give it a shot. And so we did a FaceTime with them and they're like, oh my God, that unit's way nicer. Anyhow, that's perfect. So we went and, and hopped back in our van and we're coming up to do some spring skiing while our, while our place is being rented out. And with the cost of diesel, we'll probably break even on the month, but that's okay. We still get our, <laughs> yeah. our, our travel paid for. Right, which is like super cool because I know a lot of people who they say that's almost like something that they do on their honeymoon or once they retire, you know, like they'll buy this RV or convert something and travel the United States. But it's literally like, will your employer let you work remotely? Well, one, or do you have enough like income coming in passively or actively from your real estate investments to be able to like take a little break, sabbatical, mental health, whatever word you want to use to be able to actually go and do that, right? Like you're a great example of it. Like you can do it. You just have to ask yourself the right questions or your boss, the right questions or your spouse, the right questions in order to get it actually going. But even for the fact that you can do it, you know, for a month or a month and a half is still sweet, right? Like 
Totally. Yeah. Even if it's just like two weeks of vacation time for some other people. Right. And then two weeks of working remotely, like that is cool. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. It doesn't have to be this big full-time endeavor. And I mean, we've met so many people on the road doing this both full-time and not full-time. But if you think about it, if your average person has a mortgage, let's call it two grand a month, and they can rent out their house for 1800, 1500 bucks, maybe even two grand and break even, that's a $2,000 expense that they no longer have, right? That's like net zero. And so people think, oh, I can't afford to. Well, maybe you're closer than you think. Yeah. Totally. Or you just need to get a house that isn't four times the size for you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that's another great way to put it. Right. I mean, because you hear that too, like, oh, I will, my house won't cash flow. I'm like, well, we should start there then. <laughs> right. Absolutely. A question about, so you have a house hack that you're doing in California and the rest you've kind of consolidated. Do you sell all those other ones and the other markets you're talking about, like Michigan and Alaska and Southern California as well, and then like buy a bunch of stuff in Cincinnati now? So starting to now. So I sold uh, one of the Southern California properties last year during the pandemic. So I thought we had hit a peak and like- Here we are. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, here we are. So actually I'm selling the second one uh, that I own down there as well doing a 1031 out to some short-term rentals out in the Smoky Mountains in Tennessee, like wow. everybody else and their brother and sister. Yep. <laughs> yeah. That's exciting. It's, it's the cool thing to do these days, apparently. Yeah. Will you travel out there and visit it? I would love to at some point, but I, I purchased one out there last year via 1031 exchange as well and have never seen it. So I've got a, a really great team out there. That's my eyes and ears, boots on the ground for me. So would love to go visit at some point. Is it, did you buy in like Seaverville or? Exactly. I did. Yeah. So (laughs) the Seaverville Gatlinburg Pigeon Forge area is just like exploding. And so last year when we bought, we thought it was expensive. And again, now we're today recording this, you know, April, 2022, we're looking at the price thinking, oh my gosh. Yeah. Right. Like, why didn't we buy more last year? (laughs) Why didn't we buy more last year? Yeah. Or three years ago. What's killer is like, and my agent said, Michael, you got to stop doing this, is you look on Zillow and you see what the price is sold for. And like two years ago, places were selling for like 250, 280, and now they're selling for 850, 900 a million. Yeah. It's like it's crazy. Oh, yeah. It's unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> it's unbelievable. I got a fun fact about, or how, how are you going to say it? It's supposed to be Sevierville because Susie's great, 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 great grandfather was the founder of that city. First governor First, of first governor of Tennessee. Yeah. Yeah. No way. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. That is remarkable. <laughs> that's no <laughs> reason why we last name. I'm like, that's so similar. Yeah. <laughs> that's why I say nobody pronounces it right. Sevier, but like throughout time, they've just pronounced it wrong this entire time. And now there's a city named after it, right? So it's like. Oh my gosh. So I, I can't tell you how many times I got corrected, right? Because I'm the, the West Coaster trying to like Severville. And they're like, no, we say it's Severeville here. Severe. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> That's good to know. But I'm going to tell them, actually, I think you might be mistaken. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that'll go over very right well. Shot, the yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah right. like, we're not French around here. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so cool. So have you been, Susie? Yes. My dad has del- intentionally brought us there because at the Capitol, there's a statue of John S- Severe. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, I will, I can't wait to tell everyone I know. <laughs> so cool. I'm in the presence of greatness. This is awesome. Oh, okay. We're, we need to go back into talking about real estate now. I want how, what is it like teaching people about real estate? Oh, it is. It's so fun. Like it's something I, I always joke. Cause it's something I was doing anyhow, but now I just get paid to do it. Yes. So, and I, I love to help people. I think like education, just in general, like the unsung heroes of society. And it's something that's changed my life in a massive, massive way. And I know it's going to change like generationally. I don't have any kids yet, but we're planning on having kids as long as they don't screw it up. It's going to be changing our family's, you know, family tree for a long time to come. And to be able to give that gift or help someone else either see the light or start their journey or whatever metaphor we want to call it, I think is really, really selfishly like amazing. It makes me feel really good. So I I get kind of the warm and fuzzies from doing it. So I love it. I love it. It's a lot of fun. And the best way to do something or learn something better is to teach it. That's kind of the age old adage. And so it it helps me stay focused 
and refine some of my skills when I'm teaching others to do it because I'll get a question. I'm like, I don't know the answer. Let's go find out together. Yeah. And so it, it just, it's a way that I think that helps keep me humble. keeps me learning. keeps me open. So if I recommend it to anyone yeah. who, who is interested. That's cool. What are like the main topics that you're teaching? So I, we cover everything. And so, okay, let me take a step back. We don't cover everything. We, our main, our main focus is like for buy and hold investing. Okay. And so we started programs called the Roofstock Academy. And so we start from just starting out for those folks that have maybe heard of real estate investing, but don't know how to get involved or aren't quite sure if it's for them, mm -hmm. all the way up to scaling your portfolio and disposition, selling your properties and people who maybe want to get involved in different asset classes, but maybe aren't quite sure how to do that, what multifamily looks like, or mm -hmm. how to get above 10 loans because they've hit their DTI loan limit. So, and everything in between. So it's, I've done enough and seen enough to be dangerous. And like I said, I hadn't house hacked yet. So this was something I wanted to add to the resume so I could yeah. talk about it more intelligently. But so, yeah, we, we talk about anything and anything that people want to talk about or learn about. I love that. That's cool. So, so you mentioned you have a house hack, you have uh, you have some short-term rentals, maybe, you know, a couple more on the, online or coming soon, uh, as you make some sales. And then you have, I'm assuming a bunch of like, you know, small multi or single family buy and holds in Cincinnati, Kentucky area. Is that it? Is, what else, is there anything else that makes up a portfolio or? So there's some medium-sized multifamily in there too. Okay. I, nice. I took on a, a development project. Oh, what nice. unbeknownst to me, <laughs> it was a 20,000 square foot commercial mixed use building that had like three or f yeah, four residential units and three commercial spaces. So cool. massive commercial spaces, smaller units. And I decided the city of Kentucky was actually giving away money to developers to convert units into residential, convert commercial to residential because they have a housing, a housing shortage. Yeah. And, and a lot of cities are actually doing this, which is pretty cool. And so I said, this is great. I'll do this. I'll take this on. Having no idea like what I was doing, having never done a development project uh, or worked with city local governments. So way over my head to begin with, the project took on a life of its own. Now when it's done, it'll be 15 residential units and two commercial units. Mm -hmm. uh, two and a half years and two fires later. I was going to say, is it fireproof? But <laughs> it is now. It is now. So that's been a whole whirlwind of an experience into it of itself. So that that's probably been the, the biggest bulk of my portfolio from a mental bandwidth and from a financial standpoint as well. Wow. Did the fires happen while residents live there? The fires happened during construction. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which could be argued is is arguably worse. And nice. so I was locked in a like a two year insurance battle dealing with this. And it's just been like to anyone listening, I don't recommend having fires in a building. I know people always joke, like, oh, we'll just burn it down. Like, don't do that. It's gonna be way more trouble than it's worth. <laughs> And like, and, and I think the worst part about it was I used to work as a fire protection engineer. Yeah. yeah. Like all my, I like couldn't show my face at the office, you know, actually I had quit my job prior to then, but I like, didn't want to tell anyone that I had a fire in a building because that's so embarrassing. <sighs> so it was just, it's Man. just been a whole whirlwind, but now we're through the, getting through it. Uh, all, project's almost done. It's going to start getting leased up here pretty shortly. So very excited about that. Yeah. Well, well, yeah, it seems like a, quite a challenge. Right. For sure. <laughs> well, development in itself is a challenge and then adding all that additional stress and, and pain on top of it. Yeah. Yes. Very frustrating. <laughs> and I was dealing with most of this stuff from abroad too. That was the worst, I think, worst part about it was I got the call from my property manager on a Sunday while I'm in Costa Rica. He goes, hey, Michael, you're probably wondering why I'm calling you on a Sunday. And I said, yes, Josh, I am wondering. He goes, ah, there's a fire in the building. So just, yeah, don't do it if you can avoid it. What are you most excited about right now? I am most excited right now about finishing this development project and <laughs> seeing, seeing the fruits of my labor come to yeah. fruition and then also getting more involved in short-term rentals. I think it's a really cool space. It's just becoming so much more popular and so much more accessible now. Mm -hmm. and so when you have more people doing something, you get better stuff as a result. So like necessity is the mother of all invention, right? The more minds you have thinking about a similar problem, the better solutions we tend to get. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really excited about that. My wife and I want to buy one and self-manage which is not something that we've done in the past for a very remote property. So we're, we're very excited about that as well. Nice. How, why do you want to self-manage? Because I think it's just something that could be easier than most people think. So we converted our old primary into a short-term rental, which then we converted back to a long-term rental at the same price, which is like mind boggling. And so we, I was managing that one remotely and it just like, wasn't that hard. Once we had the systems in place, which what everyone talks about, it's not rocket science. 
And so we want to give it a go with a more destination market, with a more vacation market uh, down in Southern California and just see how we can, how we can go at it. And I mean, the ultimate goal is to have my wife leave her job. That's exactly. kind of, I think what we all aspire to, or the goal is to have total financial freedom work if you'd like to. Mm -hmm. I really like my job. I'll probably continue to work. If she had it her way, probably less so. So we'd be able to, you know, we'd start building, building that up for her. Absolutely. As far as short-term rentals go, since you want to get more involved with that, like, uh, what are you doing to like, you know, get ahead of like a lot of the cities who are like putting restrictions on short-term rentals and stuff like that? Like just not investing in those specific areas or like making sure that there's some kind of law or when it's in place where that might not go away or they're not going to put restrictions on short-term rentals in the future. Yeah, it's a really good question, Michael. And I asked the same question of, we had a guest on our show, Avery Carl. She's got the short-term shop, the short-term show. And so we was chatting with her about it because like, that's what her bread and butter is. Like she's built mm -hmm. her business around the short-term rental space. And she goes, well, she's not concerned with historically vacation markets because she highly doubts there's going to be change right. or ordinances put in place this this far into the future, right? This is how people have made their living for so long. Right. There's going to be so much pushback there. So that's, I'm kind of pitching my my wagon to to her horse, so to speak. And traditional vacation markets that have always been vacation markets that don't have a large hotel presence, yeah. I think are, are fairly safe bets. Right, because even in those vacation markets, right? Like if you're not short-term renting it, then it's just sitting. You know, like that's what people were doing before, like before Airbnb right. became a thing. They just had another house that was just sitting most yeah. of the time. So like, why right. not give it like some love and give other people an experience? Yeah. Yeah. Like, totally. that, in this, yeah. this city's economies are based like 90% or, you know, 80, or at least 85% on like the, on the, the vacationers, the people who go there, you know? Yeah. Um, and the city gets tax revenue from it. Yeah. Like, yeah. Exactly. It's a win, win, win. And but so I think it's a big part, like without getting political, like I think hotels are pretty big advocates for anti Airbnb because they saw their, I mean, it's just like the taxi industry with Uber, like mm -hmm. they saw their profits getting cut into. Yeah. And so they're big anti advocates. I don't know, a uh, yeah. lot of opposition yeah. to, <laughs> to that coming in, right? So yeah. Another thing that we've done too is like, so we have eight Airbnbs in Arlington, Texas. And Arlington is very unique in that like the city has like cordoned off like a one mile by one mile like square area where uh, short-term rentals are allowed. However, oh, okay. you still have, and like, so they're like nowhere outside this area, but it's like in the entertainment district, right? Where people need, you know, short-term rentals. And it's right next to the state, the Cowboy Stadium and things like that. So like, we made sure that we did all research on that before investing there. But like the city has cracked down so much. They finally, I think this is maybe hopefully the last time they cracked down, they drew a line right around this area where you can have short-term rentals. Uh, and then we still have to pay like hotel occupancy tax and all those other taxes to make sure that right. that the short-term rentals are paying the same tax as like a hotel would and the city makes the same amount of money, right? So yeah. Right, yeah. So we actually have two Airbnbs in Lisbon, Portugal, and it's a similar thing. Uh, like they've kind of drawn districts around where short-term rentals are allowed. And so we got our license before these ordinances went into effect. But I, I've been hearing a lot of cities doing that. Like if you have it, you're kind of grandfathered in. If you don't, you can get on a waiting list and they'll, it's kind of like a liquor license, like in South, like Tahoe, they're doing it. Like we'll do 900 short-term rental licenses. And if you're not one of those 900, you got to wait until someone gives up their license to get one. Gotcha. Okay. So I almost wasn't listening to what you just said, just because my brain stopped when you said you have two in Lisbon, Portugal. I feel like that should have been mentioned at the very beginning. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we've got to talk about this. Yeah. Oh, like, I, mean, I have at, so many questions. We've been looking at real estate in Algarve. And so... Yeah, we need to. Yeah, it's, it's the UK's like vacation haven. So yeah. why Lisbon, Portugal? So my wife found out about a program called the Golden Visa, which a lot yeah. of countries have. So you're familiar with it. So Yeah, but I want you to tell everyone about it now. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So any, anyone listening who's not familiar with it, it's basically a scheme. They call it a scheme. And that sounds like a, like a shady thing, but it's, it's yeah. a program rather for, for These people. These are good for... on this side of the world. Yeah. <laughs> oh, see, oh, yeah, that's... <laughs> it's true. <laughs> that's so interesting. I had no idea. All right. So a, a uh, what is that? It would be an Eastern Hemisphere scheme. It's a, it's a program for, for, for non-nationals to be able to get residency, permanent resident status and ultimate citizenship and passports to other countries. And so I think like Barbados has one and Granada has one, Spain has one, Portugal has one. And so th the way that the programs work is different in, in every country, but the way it works in Portugal is they have a couple different options for you to obtain citizenship. 
And one of those is via property investment. And so my wife, Claire, found this out and she was like, um, we could do this. And I was like, no, we can't. No, that's <laughs> not important. what are you talking about? She's like, no, we could do this. So we started looking more into it. And the more we learned about it, the more we decided like, yes, we, we can do this. And so we learned a ton about the program. We had visited a bunch of times previously and just totally fell in love with the country. And for anyone who hasn't been, I highly recommend it. It's an amazing place, like amazing culture, amazing people, phenomenal weather, great food, amazing wine, just like all of the best things. And people joke, it's like California was 30 years ago. It's very laid back. It's, you know, you, you, you guys know. So we loved it. And so we decided, yeah, let's pursue this. So we ended up purchasing a property and the, the way that the, the property purchase purchases work over there is slightly different than the US. So we had to learn all about that process and get connected with a lawyer, what have you. And so now we're back in the States and my agent calls me. He goes, hey, Michael, the seller screwed up some paperwork. We hadn't closed on the property yet. We're in escrow. Seller screwed up the paperwork and this property is no longer going to qualify for the golden visa. What do you want to do? Mm -hmm. I was like, what do you mean it's not going to qualify? So long story short, he said, look, you can get your money back. We can just give you your money back or you can buy it and have it be an investment property. And I said, what about flipping it? Because the way that the, these Golden Visa property specific work in Portugal, they call it like a rehab, but basically they tear down the entire existing structure, leave the front wall facing the street and rebuild the entire building. Mm. That's their version of a rehab. So this was one of these, this was one of those units. And so it was physically being constructed. And I said, let's flip it. And he goes, okay, let's flip it. So then COVID strikes, oh. right? So we mm. couldn't flip it. But the cool thing was that I was able to get a Portuguese mortgage on it at like 2%. Wow. So I got a Portuguese mortgage. I took the money that I was going to spend on that one. And I put it into another property that did qualify for the golden visa. The original property that we were going to flip COVID hit. So we rented it out Airbnb. It's doing fairly well now. And so now we have two properties in Portugal. The second one is still being built. It's almost be done being constructed. Uh, it should be done end of summer. And that'll be in Airbnb as well. How much did you, not like how much did you have to put down like dollar wise, but like percentage wise? So that was a bummer. So I had to put down 50% of the purchase price. Okay. So the loan to value is a little bit different. Yeah. But now that it was physically, that first one was physically built and done and performing, I went back to my banker and I said, hey, it's worth a ton more now. Can I get, can I refinance? And she goes, okay. So I was able to pull out a little bit more. So I think we're probably at about 60% loan to value of the original purchase price. They okay. were still kind of weird about future value kind of a thing, appreciated value. But still, I'm like, whatever. So that's a second mortgage that's fixed at like 1%. I mean, European mortgages are, are very cheap, different yeah. than in the States. They're super cheap. Yeah. That's exciting. Yeah. So we are just over the moon about it. We're waiting for our visas to show up in the mail and to, to go. But we started learning Portuguese. So oh, it's been a very really fun cool. process. Look at that. Yes. All because of real estate. <laughs> All because of real estate. All because of real estate. That's that is awesome. so sweet. It's a really cool yeah. story. To transition us into the final four, these are yeah. the adventurous four. These are four exploratory questions we ask all of our guests. Michael, are you ready okay. to answer these four questions? I sure hope so. <laughs> <laughs> all right. They all have to do with travel and impact and everything. You're going to love it. So awesome. First question is, where is one place you wish to travel to and why? Um, Bali. I've always wanted to go to Bali. I'm an avid surfer. I have tons of, like all my surfer friends, like dude, Bali's the best. I love also massages. My mom is a massage therapist for years growing up as a kid. And everyone's like, you must get massage all the time. Like, no, if your parent does something for work, they never want to do it for you personally. Like I'm tired <laughs> of work. So I love it. So you can get really cheap massages down there and the surfing's amazing. And those two things go really hand in hand together. So Bali, That's Indonesia. Awesome. That's, That's cool. cool. So the second thing, what is one thing on your bucket list and how are you leveraging real estate investing to achieve it? Oh man. So skydiving is for sure on my bucket list. Leveraging real estate. I will take the earnings of one of my properties for a month and just go pay for the skydive trip. I have I don't know if, do you guys have Groupon? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I haven't looked it up. I haven't looked. Yeah. Okay. But, but you know what? You're familiar. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there are Groupon for skydiving. There's a group on for skydiving. I'm like, that's one thing I'll just pay full price for. I don't yeah. want to discount, like, <laughs> skydiving <laughs> trip. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm just paying full price. So I'll, I'll take some money and, and go skydiving. And my wife wants to do it with me. So we're very excited about it. That's awesome. In the discount shop, it's like Jim over there packing his shoe, dropping a cigarette in. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. Like, no, no thanks. I, I'm a good tipper. I'll tell you that at the front end. And I'm paying full price. <laughs> that's awesome. Oh, that's funny. The third question <laughs> I have for you, Michael, is <laughs> what is one piece of advice you have for someone who wants to start passively investing in real estate? 
I think, and because I'm slightly biased, but I would probably share the same piece of advice if I wasn't in education, but just go get educated. I think it's so important and so critical that people do because you talk to people that had invested previously because their friends or family were, and they didn't really take the time to go understand and get educated. And they're like, oh, real estate investing sucks. You lose all your money to this and that. And it's like, yeah, that you had a bad experience, but that doesn't mean that other people will. That's like saying you got in a car crash. You saying cars are bad. No, like maybe you didn't operate it correctly or maybe right. so, something didn't go well because you didn't understand how to use the vehicle properly. And so this is just another vehicle. So understanding how to learn, learning how to operate it responsibly, I think is hyper important. And you might also learn that it's not a good vehicle for you. Yeah. And so you'll yeah. save yourself the time, heart, headache and energy like go do something else. Real estate yes. could be for everyone, but it doesn't have to be. I love it. And then the fourth and final question is, if you had unlimited resources available to you, how would you leave an impact? Oh my gosh. I would go build free housing communities like all over the place. It that seems like a no brainer. Like there's such a need for affordable housing in this country. And I think around the world too. Yeah, I can only really speak to, to what I've seen it locally here in the States and also, but in Portugal, like it's a massive, massive problem. So to be able to give people one of the three basic human needs that are requirement for life, shelter, all about it. And I think yeah. you can make a massive impact and you'd be amazed to see what people can do once they have their basic needs met. Right? Like everything starts, like their brain just starts acting differently, right? Because they no longer have to, like they're not in fight mode, like so severely anymore. And that's huge. It's huge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To be able to unlock that part of the brain, to be able to focus on something else other than survival, like you said, Susie, I think is remarkable, like would be remarkable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Totally agree. So before we end the show, Michael, would you mind sharing with our adventurous family where they can learn more about you? Yeah, totally. So you can come uh, find me directly. I'm on Twitter. I'm fairly active on Twitter, which I never in a million years thought I would be, but my <laughs> thing, you got to get a Twitter. So I got a Twitter. So I'm at Michael Album. I'm also at the Roofstock Academy, roofstockacademy.com. So come check us out there if you're interested to learn more. Awesome. Hey, well, Michael, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. It truly was a pleasure. And I'm just so excited that you're investing in Portugal. Like that's so cool. So next investment. Yeah, talk about that more. <laughs> we'll, we'll take it offline. Thank you both so much, Susie Michael. It was such a pleasure to be here. Really appreciate you taking the time to have me on. Absolutely. So much fun. So until next time, explore more adventure awaits. Woo!